Offering is a good thing, not because we need money, it's just an opportunity for us to be part of giving, and uh, so thankful for this church. And I just want to say uh, for myself and on behalf of all of our pastors, we are, we are honored to be, I'm honored to be one of your pastors, and I'm so thankful for this church, uh, a blessing that you all are to, to us, to one another, to the community, what an incredible uh, family to be part of, and we just want to express our, on behalf of the pastors how much we appreciate and are humbled uh, to be your pastors. I know that there are a number of people this week who have lost loved ones, especially parents, and so if you would keep those people in your prayers this week, whether you know them or, or not, uh, just, just pray for one another. That's, the Bible says in doing so we fulfill the, uh, we fulfill the law of Christ when we, when we um, bear one another's burdens. You, know, you ever have those moments? <laughs> hey, we got any Cyclone fans in the house? Wearing your colors next week? Any, any Hawkeye fans? Any Drake fans? You and I? Baylor? <laughs> next week will be a lot of fun. We're, we're all the pastors are going to be wearing jerseys. It's a dress down Sunday next week, so we're... Uh, we're uh, looking forward to a good time throughout the month of September as we uh, just have this theme of show up September. Come, be here. It looks like you showed up today. There's just a few spots uh, left here, and it's, uh, that's amazing. School started, and when school gets back in, in routine, it seems like it brings us all back to n normal routines. So it's good to see all of you this morning. And uh, we've been in a series the past couple of weeks, and I'm going to be concluding it today. It's kind of unusual for us to have a series where one person preaches more than, more than once in a, in a row, but uh, I've been honored to be able to share these couple of weeks. And uh, we, the series has been life, entitled Life is a Highway, and uh, I hope that you've enjoyed it. I've heard some good comments. Uh, actually, a couple of comments that I heard from last week were, wow, you were really stepping on people's toes. I love it. Actually, this is what it said. You were really stepping on my toes today. I love it. And I'm thinking, wow, that's... <laughs> I, I, my intention isn't to step on toes, but I just want to be honest and truthful, and it's, it's a hard thing to be, to be direct. Some of you, as a parent, sometimes you know. I mean, sometimes it takes the right, the right situation. It's not hard for you to be direct with your kids. You know, but we love, we love each other so much that sometimes we... We're not, we're not as tough as we need to be with each other. And uh, so this is kind of draws me out. You know, I, just being a pastor, I said in the early service, you know, preaching isn't my, my favorite thing to do as far as ministry goes. It's not that I, I don't like it. It's not that I hate it. It's not that I won't do it. I preach every Sunday if I, if, if I, if I, if I have to. I enjoy hearing other people and the voices of all of our other pastors, and I've, I know that, that you guys do as well. Um, I'm rambling, so let's probably just time to get into, uh, into, this, into the message. So life is a highway, and we've been looking at this, this theme. Um, Raska Flat said it, the opening line of his song, life is like a road that you travel on. And so we've been looking at life being uh, like, a, like a highway, and so... Uh, the first week we talked about destination, about how important it is. If you're going to take a trip, you've got to know where you're going. So if you're going to be able to get directions to where that is, you've got to know where that is that you're going so that you know how to get there because uh, direction is what determines your destination. So we asked this question, what, what direction is your life going? That will tell you where you are heading to in life. So uh, there's a lot of, um, we, we have a lot of good, many uh, and good intentions in life, but unless we put action to those intentions, it's never going to get us where we want to go. It's, it's direction, not intention, that gets us to our destination. Jesus, Jesus said uh, these words, he said, um, uh, Narrow is the gate, narrow is the path that leads to life, and very few people choose that path. There's a, 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 a wide gate, a broad gate, and, and a wide path, and many people find that path, and that path is leading to destruction. So we're either on one of those two roads today, as we sit here and we consider our own life, where is life heading for you? 
Are you on that broad road where everybody's choosing, or have you chosen the narrow road? So direction is key. It's a key to where we're gonna end up in this journey of life. And last week we talked about guardrails. You, you're familiar with guardrails if you're a driver. You know they're those barricades that you find alongside of the road, usually on the, on the edges of bridges to keep you from driving off the edge. You'll find them oftentimes around curves uh, on, the, on the highway or where there's a, a steep hill. But there are many places I've driven where it's a steep drop off on the side and um, there's no guardrail there. I mentioned, uh, where, where was I this, this summer? I was at Glacier National Park, up on the mountain. At the top of the mountain, uh, there is a, it's a pretty, pretty sharp drop off on the side. We were there this, this summer and someone had decided, they were scared on that road and decided to turn around, did something to their car and backed up traffic for hours in both directions. We were wanting to go to the park and they wouldn't even let people in, so. Um, it's, it's nice to have guardrails. And so on the highway, guardrails are important. In life, it's important for us to have guardrails, to have set up boundaries for our lives, to place guardrails in those areas where um, God's word says, this is, this is what you should do, this is what you shouldn't do. All of us may place those guardrails in different places based on our, our, our own experiences. But we know where to put those based on God's word and our relationship with God. And so we set those boundaries and we say, in my life, this is as far as I'm going to go and no farther. And so if we try to veer off that path, it's going to be something that's erected in our life that's going to, we're going to smash up against to protect us from going off the cliff, so to speak. So guardrails are important, they're necessary, and um, I believe that some of our greatest regrets could have been avoided in life had we had some guardrails in place in those areas. So we've been looking at the book of Ephesians chapter five. If you have a Bible and you wanna turn there, we're gonna read uh, through that portion of scripture again. Been looking primarily at three verses, 15, 16, and 17, but I'm gonna expand that a little bit today because I wanna talk about uh, some things in either direction there. Ephesians chapter five, we're gonna start with verse 14 and read through 21. This is what Paul says to the Ephesians, he says this, awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. I want you to think this morning about uh, your life and in life where there are um, systems set up uh, different alert or warning devices that are set up in your life. Some of you uh, may recognize these. Hopefully you have something like this in your home, right? Some of you, were, some of you weren't paying attention, and that, just that sound right there gets your attention, right? None greater than when you're in the, in the bed at night in the middle of a dead sleep and you start hearing this. It's, it's hard to go back to sleep after that. You know, what I'm, you know what I'm talking about? Okay, it's important that we have things like this in our life because it's a warning sign. It's a, it's a device that's, gonna, that's signaling that there is potential danger down the road. I don't know if you've experienced this, but I've been asleep in my bed at night and sometimes I just hear this. You, you're groaning too. It's not telling you dangers on the horizon. It's telling you Battery's low, but how many of you know there's maybe six or seven of these in your house, and you'll stand there where, you know, there's, there's several around, and, and you're trying to figure out which one it is. You stand, under, you stand under the one you think it is and wait for that, and then you go, that's not that one, so I tell you to have to get up. I've done this before where I've taken every single one of them out and replaced the batteries, and I've done all but one, and I still get But how many of you are thankful for smoke alarms? If you hear this kind of a sound going off in your house, what it's saying is danger. Take notice. 
It's an it's a early detection sign that something is going on in your house. You probably need to find a place uh, of safety. Uh, not only are there smoke alarms, some of you may have carbon monoxide detectors. Um, in Iowa, we have tornado sirens, those sirens that go off. Um, it's, actually, it's getting ready to go off this Saturday at noon. It's the first Saturday of the month. It's always a pleasant sound when it's at noon on the first Saturday of the month and it's sunny outside. But how do you know that sound when it's dark, the clouds are dark and it's ominous, the wind's blowing, and you hear those sirens fire up? It's, it's just a sinking feeling. This summer we had... Uh, just, just last month, we had, you know, tornadoes that hit the area in Bondurant and uh, um, Marshalltown and Pella. Devastation. Homes, cars, businesses. Uh, I was just reviewing that uh, yesterday. There were 17 injuries in the course of those tornadoes that happened that afternoon, uh, but zero fatalities. Very, very thankful for that. And it's because of early, early detection because of radar, because of sirens, because of alerts that come on your phone. It's the, the WEA alert. I don't know if you've ever, ever experienced one of those that go off on your phone. It usually happens in the middle of the night because there's an amber alert. You know, I, I hate those things because one, it means that somebody's been taken advantage somewhere, a child, but two, when I get woke up like that, it's super hard to go back to sleep. We were sitting in a church service uh, shortly after we moved into this building on a Sunday evening. Pastor Courtney was preaching, and uh, about halfway through her message, uh, we started hearing these faint alarms, and uh, little by little, it started getting louder and louder. We realized there were alarms going off on people's phones. It's the first time I'd ever had that, had that experience. So I, I know this hasn't been around for a long time, but evidently, it was in place then, and we start hearing this, wah, 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 wah. it's just kind of going off all around the congregation. We realize we're, in, we're under a tornado warning. So in the middle of that Sunday night service, we all got up, we went down into the orchestra pit, behind the orchestra pit, and sat there for maybe 20, 30 minutes until the coast was clear. But I'm thankful for warnings like that, because if something were to happen, uh, we're sitting here and, and not paying attention to anything. We need, we need warning devices in our life. Uh, there's that little um, sound that goes off in your car when you don't have your seat belt on. So anybody, anybody annoyed by that? Okay, that's because you're not wearing your seat belt. You just put the seat belt on. I was in Pastor Weaver's car and evidently his is named Susan. <laughs> No, no, no joke. I've been riding in the car and it's going beep, beep, beep. He said, I got it, Susan. Be quiet, Susan. <laughs> telling on him. I'm telling on him. All of these systems we have in place there to, to warn us, to help us. It's advanced notification of imminent devastation. Advanced notification that there could be imminent devastation. The best protection always in any situation, uh, physical, getting, getting regular physical checks, uh, could be cancer or whatever, early detection is always the best protection, right? Early detecting is always the best. About 60 years ago, uh, this next warning device that I'm gonna talk about was, was first developed. It's just in recent history been implemented on a large scale, uh, and that is uh, rumble strips. You may be familiar with rumble strips. You've driven over those, you know those things on the side of the road, you hit them. Some of you drive over that just to get the sound, I think. So just. They're, they're, they're a series of cuts or grooves or bumps in the road that, um, that warn you of impending danger. What it's basically telling you is that you're, you're moving in the wrong direction. There's other names for them. They're, they're called wake-up calls, sleepy lines, alert strips, audible lines, sleepy bumps, drunk bumps, growlers, drift lines, whatever you want to call them. That's, they, 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 they do the, it's the same thing but they're very descriptive. Rumble strips are, are both something audible that you hear and tangible, it's something that you feel. If you ever drive over those, you, f you can feel it in the steering wheel and it also makes that noise. And basically it's just yelling at you saying, hey, you're, you're, you're driving off the road, you're moving off the road. There's a video that I wanna show you the, uh, this morning and, and this is actually a place in New Mexico 
Uh, and these, these strips are not in the, off of the edge of the road. It's actually in the road, in a road where they're trying to keep the, the speed down. But watch this. This is kind of, kind of a cool, uh, cool experience. On the highway in New Mexico, if you drive 45 miles an hour, which is the speed limit, this is what you get. Very cool. So at 45 miles an hour, you're driving over that, you get that tune. If you go any faster than that, it sounds like junk. It's, 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 it's annoying. So uh, that's, that's actually bumps in the road that keep you at a certain speed. So um, thanks to YouTube, we don't have to go there and experience it. We just experienced it this morning. I saved you a lot of money. Rumble strips. Rumble strips save lives. They es- the cost of rumble strips, they estimate about $500 to $6,000 per mile. But they say that the, the studies show that um, rumble strips account for 50% less loss of life. So I'd say it's definitely, definitely worth it. I don't know if you've ever had an experience uh, where you have drifted on the, on the road. Drifting is real. Drifting, drifting happens. It happens when you're in the car. It happens when, when just in life. Drifting happens when you stop paying attention. Drifting happens when you fall asleep at the wheel. Drifting happens when you're drowsy. In life, it can happen in your finances, it can happen in relationships, it can happen in your marriage. Maybe you've heard people say, we just drifted apart. You ever heard that phrase? Of course, of course you drifted apart because you took your hands off the wheel and you stopped paying attention. That's what happened. Drifting happens in life. The thing about drifting is that we never drift the right direction. We always drift the wrong way. I was, uh, the summer of 1988, I told you a story about selling books in Texas. Well, let me tell you about the trip there. On a, it, on a Friday afternoon, we finished sales school training in Nashville. About three o'clock, um, my territory and, and the group of people that I was selling books with, was, we were assigned Texas. We didn't find out until like two o'clock in the afternoon. At three o'clock in the afternoon, we're loading up our cars and we're heading to Texas. I was going to Jacksonville, Texas, but we were traveling as a team. And uh, it was about, it's like 680 miles from Nashville to Jacksonville, and uh, which back then at 55 miles an hour takes quite a while. Uh, but we were about uh, 10 hours into that trip. It was about one or two o'clock in the morning, and we were pulling into Longview, Texas. And it had been a, a long drive, and I'm in the car by myself. Of course, I had my tape, my tape box that cassette tapes, and they were all lined up. I'd probably gone through, you know, a few rows of tapes. Anybody know what cassette tapes are? Okay. <laughs> probably gone through most of them in this trip, and you know, I've got the radio crank. I didn't have air conditioning in my car, so I had the windows down. I've just got air blown. I'm doing everything I can to stay awake, but I had those moments where, you know, you're driving, and you think everything's fine, and then you jerk like this, like I, I just fell asleep, and I jerked myself awake. I had those moments, but I didn't have a cell phone. There's no way I could communicate to the other people driving, so, you know, I, I, I really needed to stop. I really needed to take a break, but I'm driving with a caravan of other people, so, so of course, we just keep driving. We're nearing Longview, pulling into Longview, and um, I had one of those wake-up calls, not because there were rumble strips, but I started, I started ha- listening, hearing, feeling the sensation of gravel kicking up underneath my car, Uh, which woke me up and I realized I'm off to the median of the road, one tire in the grass, one tire in the gravel, and there's a sign right in front of me. I woke up just in enough time to turn my steering wheel, which I'm sliding sideways in the gravel, and I somehow made it back on the road without rolling the car or anything like that. I I had a hard time going to sleep after that one. But um, (laughs) there was a time... time, when we were youth pastors in Montana, it seemed like we were all, and when you're in Montana, you live so far away from everywhere, but we, we had taken a, a group of students to Denver for, for an event. And uh, of course, you know, we, we were driving back. It seems like we we're always driving through the night just because it takes so long to get wherever. We were driving through the night, coming back. I was in a van pulling a trailer. And I don't know if you ever had these moments where I realized I, I'm like, I'm, I'm missing like 10 or 15 miles. I, I realize I'm at a place, but I don't remember from 10 or 15 miles ago. Have you ever had that experience? Like, I've just blanked out. Like, I've gone 10 or 15 miles, 
and I'm realizing I, I can't account for that. How did I get where I'm going right now? I think I've fallen asleep, but I'd stayed on the road. You ever had moments like that? It's scary. I've had a couple of moments like that, and Jeannie's got so paranoid, we don't drive through the night ever, ever again. But I do like to have a little fun with her. So, you know, <laughs> she's, she's driving, she's riding in the passenger seat. She's my co-pilot. Uh, she gives good directions sometimes, but... Um, <laughs> But, you know, it's, it's, it's evening. I don't know, it might have been during the day, but, you know, she's on this side of me, I'm driving. And just to give you the perspective, I'm, I'm doing one of these where I got my head hang, hung like this. Of course, I got one eye open like this watching the road, but I'm doing one of these where I'm just not in my, not in my head. I thought that would be funny. <laughs> and she, she caught wind that I was doing that, and I got like a left-handed, like right across. <laughs> If I, if I wasn't falling asleep, we would have been in an accident anyway just because of what she had done. <laughs> Don't ever do that. It's not worth it. Fortunately, God was with us then too. Here's the deal. Uh, drifting, drifting is easy. Driving takes work. You have to pay attention if you're going to get where you're going and making progress to get there. You see, Thankful that there are rumble strips, but rumble strips don't keep you out of the median. They don't keep you from crossing the center line. They don't keep you from going off the road, but they speak to you, and they send you messages of impending danger. But we have to be alert, and we have to listen, because you can't correct what you don't detect. So you have to be awake. They're, they're in their place. They're doing their job. God has set up rumble strips in our lives, and I want to look at three different levels of those uh, this morning. Um, the first one being our conscience. The Bible talk, talks about it being a still, small voice or maybe a, a, a soft, gentle whisper. These are, these are internal rumble strips. I, I, I think we've all felt those. It, it's in all of us. It's that feeling or that sensation that you get that what I'm about to do is going a wrong direction. What I'm about to do is a wrong decision. You know what I'm talking about? You've experienced that before? Paul said in Romans chapter two, he's speaking of the Gentiles, and he says, Gentiles who don't have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it even without having read it. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them that they're doing right. There's something written on all of our hearts that knows right and wrong, that has God's law written on our hearts. The, the message says it like this, there's something deep within them that echoes God's yes and no, right and wrong. So our conscience tells us what's right and wrong. We have to learn to listen to the rumble strip of our conscience. Elijah was uh, on Mount Carmel with 450 prophets of Baal and won this huge victory uh, against those 450 prophets. After, after God came through and won victory there, uh, Queen Jezebel uh, makes a threat, says, I'm, I'm gonna have your head on a platter within 24 hours. He takes off and he's on a, he's, he's on a run to, to wherever. 40 days later, he ends up in a cave. He's begging God to take his life, but he finds himself in a cave on Mount Sinai. In 1 Kings chapter 19, the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. And God said to him, go out and stand before me on the mountain. And the Lord said, uh, he's, go out and stand on the mountain before me. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Elijah knew that the sound of the gentle whisper was God's voice. You see, God doesn't just reveal himself only in the, in the big, powerful, miraculous things. If we're only looking for God in the, in the big events, we're gonna miss him. Because God's voice is often found in a gentle whisper, in the quietness of your heart. And the question that I wanna ask you this morning is, are you listening to God? To hear God may require that you step out of the noise of your everyday life. 
There's certain moments where we, we might sense or feel this gentle whisper, this still small voice, a, a soft gentle nudge, and what God's doing is he's trying to hold you back. He's trying to restrict you, keep you from something dangerous. And a lot of people interpret that as God's a big killjoy, just trying to keep you from fun. The reality is God isn't a killjoy, he's got real joy for everyone that's gonna listen to him and follow his plans for their life. He's got real joy in mind for each and every one of us. It's not just happiness for a minute. God's got a life of fullness of joy. We all settle for so much less. Why is it that God lights up our conscience in certain moments or certain situations? It's because he's trying to keep us from danger. He doesn't want us to hurt ourselves. You see, God sees what we can't see. He knows things that we'll never be able to understand. And he loves you more than you can ever even begin to imagine or comprehend. You can trust God. So when you have those, those feelings, those moments of just this quiet rumble in your, in your, in your soul, it's not going to be super. It starts out as a sm- soft, quiet voice to start with. But if we start hearing this little, uh, 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 you ever heard that? Mm-hmm. Nobody's saying it to you. It's your conscience. Three reasons that we need to listen to our conscience. First is that the more that we ignore it, the harder it is to hear it. We ignore something, we hear something long enough and we ignore it and then it just kind of goes away. So when we start ignoring our conscience, it goes away. It starts out as a small, gentle whisper. But as we ignore it, it goes away. We don't, we don't want that to happen. The more, secondly, the more that you respond to the rumbles, the more you're going to be able to anticipate them. You see, the more we do something, the better we become at it. The more that we respond to the rumbles, the more we might see patterns develop. Our scripture, chapter Ephesians 5.15 says, live as wise, not as fools. So the more that we respond to the rumbling, the less we're gonna experience the rumbling because we begin to anticipate things. Proverbs 22.3 says, a prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. So a prudent person sees danger and takes precaution, but the person who's stupid, who's dumb, who's foolish, who's childish, who's naive, just keeps moving on and will suffer the consequences. See, we should begin to start spotting patterns or trends. We start see things coming and, and not put ourselves in places where we're gonna have to compromise or end up with regrets. The third reason to listen to our conscience is that it's easier, e- the easier it is for God to lead you, the more places he can take you. You know, in James, he talks about putting the bit in a horse's mouth and he can make him go wherever. And so, as God is able to lead us because we've given him that place in our life, he's able to take us places. And God really wants to take us somewhere. He really wants something for each of our lives. Jeremiah, in Jeremiah it says, God says, I know the plans I have for you. It's plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. So we need to listen to our conscience. So the first, first thing that we, that we um, where we have rumble strips is in our conscience but he also uses people in our our life. People in our life to tell us when we're drifting off course, that that, that C is companions in our life. Could be friends, could be family, could be a a key person, a a mentor, that will speak into our lives and tell us when we're drifting off course. And here's what I wanna say about that. Listen to the right voices and we'll make the right choices. Listen to the right voices you make the right choices. Listen to the right voices and you avoid the wrong places. So there's people in our life that can speak into our lives. Ephesians 5.21 that we read said, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. There's a reason. Because we need people around us that can speak into our lives, that will tell us the truth. You know, sometimes it's, it's not easy to, to have a face-to-face and say to somebody, look at me, listen. You're veering off course. And maybe I'm wrong in this, but it's worth it for me to say this to you, and you can do with it whatever you want to, but we need people in our life that will rumble us a little bit. To to submit to one another is to voluntarily put yourself under the authority of someone else, but it needs to be the right people. 
because people, to a large degree, will determine the direction of our lives. We talked about that. Uh, walk with the wise, Proverbs 13 says, and become wise. Associate with fools, and, and you'll be in trouble. We need the right people speaking into our lives. And so the question is, who, whose voices are we listening to? You see, those voices that we're listening to will either make us or break us, or at least they have a contributing factor involved in that. We need people in our lives that will rumble us in, in the right directions. So it's our conscience, our companions, and the third point, and I'll close with this point, is, is the comforter. Who's the Holy Spirit? Jesus said, John 14, 16, I'll ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. Some versions say comforter, some say counselor, some say helper, it's the Holy Spirit who will be with us wherever we go. As I, as I mentioned earlier, drifting happens and, and drifting is easy. It, 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 it takes no effort at all to drift. It's what happens when we're not paying attention. But driving takes work. So if you're gonna get where you want to go, where you need to go, you need to stay awake, you need to have a plan, you need to have a destination, you need to set up some guardrails, you need a map, and you've gotta follow those directions to get where you need to go. And that all takes effort, that takes work. Fortunately, Jesus is telling us we're not alone in this. We've got a helper who will always be with us. He'll never leave us. Paul goes on in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. He says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the rumble strips of the Holy Spirit. Aristotle, the ancient philosopher, said, nature abhors a vacuum. Basically, you know, he's looking at life and realizing nothing stays empty. Things will, places, spaces and places will always fill up. And we're gonna fill up our lives with something. The truth is, is that we do. What is it that we're filling our lives with? The question is, what will you be filled with? Paul said, don't be, don't be filled up, don't be drunk with wine. That, 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 leads to, that leads to trouble, destruction. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. I know that there's some of you in the room at, who at some point in your life, that, that was your goal. Fill your life up, fill, fill yourself up with alcohol or with drugs or whatever, whatever it might be. Filling that space up, trying to get happy, trying to forget your pain, or just following along with the crowd without a whole lot of thought. But my guess is that many, if not most, if not all of you who identify that, regret the results of filling your life up with those things. I believe what Paul is saying in Ephesians chapter 5 about not being drunk but being filled with the Spirit is that there's so much more to life. There's so much more. We're new creations in Christ. And, and we have the privilege of, of having the Holy Spirit live in us, dwell in us, take residence in us. Paul says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, for you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I want you to listen to this, and this is, this is worth the admission price that you paid to get in today, all right? So if you, if you remember anything, re listen to this, and you can write this down because it'll be up on the screen. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is to have what people get drunk trying to get. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to have what people get drunk trying to get. Think about this, why do people, why do people drink? Why do people get drunk? Because it, it frees them up, it loosens them up. I just wanna, I wanna feel more, more freedom. 2 Corinthians 3, 17, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. If we're looking for freedom, it comes from the Holy Spirit might say, well, I just like the feeling, it just helps me be, be, be bold. Okay, what, what's another name that we give for alcohol? Liquid? See, you guys know this. It gives me more courage, I'll stand up and I'll, be, but it's a, a short period of time. Acts chapter one, eight, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses, boldness, power, um, Maybe we're just looking to escape from our problems, looking for, looking for peace. Romans 14, 17, Paul says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in who? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's connected with all those things. So why are we looking for a cheap substitute? Paul's saying, be filled with the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit full in us so that we can get where we need to go because he has plans for us and he wants to take us places 
We've just got to surrender, submit, allow him to fill our lives. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, for those who are Jesus followers, the Holy Spirit took up residence in you. He became a resident in you. He resides in you. He resides in you, but does he preside in you? He's a resident in in your life, but is he the the president? Meaning, does he have control? Romans 12, 2 says, don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The NLT says, let God transform you into a new person, changing the way you think. Since we're talking about life being a highway, one of, one of a, a few major violations on the highway is DUI, driving under the influence. When Paul's talking about being filled, not with not being drunk on wine in excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, what he's talking about is who's influencing you? What are you allowing to influence your life? It's driving under the influence. Whose influence will you be controlled by? It's not a question of whether you have the Holy Spirit, but the real question is, does the Holy Spirit have you? See, the Holy Spirit is in us, but I think being filled with the Spirit answers this question, does he have you? Does he have a voice in your life? Are you listening to him? As children of God, we need to live each day not filled with alcohol or any other substance that causes more harm than we would like to admit, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. You've got to be filled with something. The challenge this morning is to be filled with the fullness of God. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? All across the room this morning, I believe the Holy Spirit's been speaking. We already know he's there. And even if you're not a follower of Jesus, he speaks through your conscience. And there's people this morning that you know you're lost without Jesus. This morning, just by a simple asking for a, a raising of hands, and you know in your heart this morning that you need Jesus. And as a way to respond, just raising your hand saying, Pastor Jeff, pray, pray with me today because I'm away from God, and I'm, today I'm making a decision to follow him. If that's you this morning, would you just raise a hand across the room? There's no judgment. There's no condemnation. This is really a good thing. You come into a place of offering yourself to Jesus. I just wait and see if there's a hand here this morning. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. The Holy Spirit's been speaking to you, and maybe you've, you've felt the rumble strips, this gentle rumble strip going off in you saying, you know what, you've been veering off course. And there's some things that he's rumbling you today in a particular direction because he wants you to be in a good place. And just quite honestly this morning, you're saying, I I feel the Holy Spirit rumbling in my heart today something. And maybe you know what that is very specifically. Maybe you don't. But if that's you this morning, you say, the Holy Spirit's speaking to me, Pastor Jeff, about a thing in my life or just about life in general. If that's you, would you just raise a hand? Holy Spirit speaking to me today about something in my life. This morning, I just want to, as we close, before we go, remind you that God loves you so much and that He is always with you. His promise is to never leave you. The Holy Spirit is in you. We just have to allow Him to be in charge, allow Him to be in control. He's speaking to us, and he's faithful to get us where he wants us to go. He knows where you need to go, and you might have an idea where you need to go. You just don't know all the details. God does. And as we just walk and surrender before him and listen to his voice, he'll speak through our conscience. He'll speak through key people in your life. The Holy Spirit will nudge you in different directions. He'll use his word. But we've got to listen. Because if we veer off course, there's no way to correct things that we don't detect. The only way to detect that is to listen to his voice. And sometimes we just need to get in a quiet place. We live in a very noisy world. 
It's a lot of noise going on. It's hard for us to get in a place where we're just quiet and still. We've become very busy with a lot of things going on. And so this week, if, if, that's, a, if that's a struggle for you, I, I would just encourage you to find some place to be still and be quiet before the Lord and listen to what he's saying. I know that he's faithful, that he'll speak. If it, even if it's just turning off the, the music or the talk radio in the car and you've got time just alone right there where you can just listen. Keep your eyes open, of course. Keep your hands on the wheel, of course. Driving takes work. Drifting is easy, right? But I'm talking about our life. Drift happens all the time. But let's let God be in control. Father, I pray this morning, God, as we leave this place, Lord, that we leave knowing, God, that you are guiding and ordering our steps. God, you have great things in store for every person in this room as they surrender and submit their lives to you. Lord, you are a resident in all those who claim Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But our prayer today is that you would be the president, that you would preside over each life, that you would direct them in the way that they should go that they would have ears to hear, not just physical ears, but just the sense, God, of your guiding and your directing. Lord, we want to listen. We need your direction. We need your wisdom. So may we be people who are quiet before you so that we can hear that soft, still voice, that gentle nudge in the right direction. Thank you, God, for placing rumble strips that will help us to know we're veering off course. God, we want to follow in the path that you have for us. So I pray your help, your power, your presence, your peace, rule and reign in every heart and life. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope this, this series has been good for you. My, my, my desire and hope that through it all is that we avoid some, some serious crashes in life. Right?